Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Above the Bar podcast, where each week we belly up to the bar with a new guest, find out what they do, who they are, and what makes them great. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. Alrighty, folks, welcome back to the Above the Bar podcast. It's your host, Sean. My audio levels sound funny. I don't know what happened. It looks like somebody turned my stuff up here, but probably a kid or a grandkid or something. But we are bellied up to the bar today with a man with three. Well, I guess I was going to say three first names, but I guess you kind of his last name's kind of ironic since he's bald. But I mean, yeah. if you're a Three Stooges fan, it makes perfect sense to me. And a Golden uh, Globetrotters fan. Uh, oh, yeah. Curly. Uh, God, Curly, Curly Neal. Curly Neal. Um, so it works perfectly fine with us. But, you know, he actually, you know, and this is going to make me laugh. I don't know if it'll make him laugh. But, like, if you want to know what Scott looks like, if you ever thought about uh, David Goggins but ordered him off of Wish, that would be Scott. <laughs> yeah. I very think that good. works perfectly. Like, because you look very much like a David Goggins. You look a little I'll, bit like I'll it. I'll take that. I've been called worse. <laughs> I'm, you know, you've probably been called worse by better. But. Either way, joining us live is CEO, author, public speaker, uh, life advocate. I like that term even better because all the stuff that Scott's got going on, Mr. Scott Allen Curley. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Sean. I appreciate you. Life advocate. I think that's what you need. I, that should be your new tagline. You know what? I'm, I'm, we're going to chew on that. I like chew it. on I that like one for a minute. I like, <laughs> I like that one because, I mean, Brother, I mean, you, you've you got a lot of things in your past, a lot of things going on. Uh, we're we're going to have, at some point, I will have to ask you, are you you're, are you still in Texas? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I was born and raised. I've started in Houston. I'm in Dallas area now. That's where, okay. my, that's where my day job is. So, yes. I, I was just in uh, Dallas in April for the first time. Oh, I, was, okay. uh, I, I was out that way. I have to tell you, we were in uh, Grapevine. Great vine, nice area, very nice area. Yep. Uh, a friend of mine is the city chef for, I guess that's the right term. He's the city chef for Grapevine. Oh, really? Like, okay. Yeah. Grapevine is yep. known for its artsy, you know, artistic and art culture and a uh, art scene, per se. So, yeah. Wine and uh, yeah, Bourbon. that's not quite wine, but hey. <laughs> Yeah, we'll we'll go with, we'll go with that too, right? <laughs> you know, it's, it's we can barrel age anything. I mean, let's go with it. But let's, let's get into it. this before before too long, before we lose everybody here, real quick. So, always as always, folks, over my right shoulder, we got the big board for stickering a cause. Maybe you've got something where you think you're the life advocate, CEO, author, public speaker. You have your own podcast, a band, a comic book. I don't care what it is. Reach out to me on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, TikTok, Instagram. They're all the Above the Bar podcast. Let me know what you got going on. I'll give you the address. You mail the, the sticker out to me, and I'll read it live for everybody here on the air so they can know what you've got going on. Also, now, this is actually kind of ties right into where you live. Our sponsors are Budget Blinds of East Greenbush and Budget Blinds of Hudson and Cooksaki, New York, and their parent company, HFC, is right there in the Dallas area. Oh, cool. So it feels right, right in with those. They're a window treatment company. They are. They offer a five-year, no questions asked warranty on everything. That means if you happen to be in the Dallas area and uh, your Cowboys are killing it right now, Dak Prescott is on a on a tear. Mm -hmm. uh, are, so you grew up outside of Houston, is it? I mean, are we Oilers? Or are we Cowboys? <laughs> I was gonna keep the show nice, and I still will, but I don't do anything Dallas. <laughs> so yes. I Look, I'm, I'm with you. I'm in, I'm Houston. Currently in, in upstate New York, and I don't do anything New York. I'll be oh, damned. Really? Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm a Baltimore guy. No, I love I'm Dallas. I love the people. But growing up in Houston, it's just not possible to be a Houston and a, a Cowboys fan at the same time. It's just not possible. I mean, but do you, but do, do, you, do you even do Texans? Oh, absolutely. That's Houston. Okay, I wasn't Houston, sure. Texans, I'm, I wasn't I'm sure. old school. So Earl Campbell, love your blue days. Or, yeah, that was my heyday. All right, so you're a homer. I, I appreciate a homer at Absolutely. all points. Absolutely. But Budget Blinds of East Greenbush, Budget Blinds of Hudson and Cooksaki, New York folks, for the month of December, they are running a 30% off of all electronics, 
uh, sale. So that means you reach out to them. It's Christmas time. This is the time of electronics. This is when everybody asks for their technology. Well, you have an opportunity to beautify your home with motorized blind shade shutters. You name it. They have some power option for it. You reach out to Budget Blinds of East Greenbush or Budget Blinds of Hudson and Cooksaki, New York, and you let them know that you're there to belly up to the bar and they're going to take good care of you. What kind of what kind of window treatments you have there in, in Dallas? You know, uh, they have a lot because it gets uh, well. They have the, the major stuff because it gets very hot and very cold up here. It's interesting. So we. But well, you guys get like weird ice storms. Like you get we like do you, and 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 believe it or not, snowstorms. And then turn around six months later, we'll be in the midst of a of a drought and a heat. You know, uh, yeah, you keep people having heat strokes. So yeah, it's, keep keep uh, it's all of that weird world up here. Keep all of it, every bit of it. But <laughs> let's get into it, Scott. So, folks, I, I really wasn't wasn't kidding when I was when I was talking about Scott's done a little bit of everything. Let's let's make sure I've got this. So, you you would consider your defining traits are tenacious, visionary, strategic thinker. Grew up outside of Houston, yes. uh, be it Cajun. Have you ever had it? I want to try it so bad. You have no idea. Cajun food. Uh, uh, be it Cajun. That's a big Houston thing. Is it really? Well, yeah, I have seen the, 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 yes, I've seen that, but it's very difficult to, um, to call, to combine the two when you're raised in a town that's literally, literally next door to Louisiana, Lake Charles. Cajun is Cajun. Cajun is Cajun. I get it. Yes. But now, and, and you, you know, to, to kind of, I guess to, to simplify it, you come from a, a difficult childhood background, which I want to hear about how, how that kind of got you to where you're at. But you've had some life-changing events that eventually, co-CEO of a tax solution LLC, you, you're you know you've integrated you know, with tax masters, uh, and eventually you know, you know truly becoming an entrepreneur and, and writing a book. Yeah. Is, that a, is that kind of the Reader's Digest version of everything? Uh, that, that's the that is definitely the shortened summary of things. Yes. Um, yeah, but I, a- I want to get into a little bit more of it. And folks, as we're talking about Scott, look, you can go to Scott Allen, A-L-L-E-N, Curly.com. A lot, all of his stuff is on there. We're going to talk about his book that actually got picked up by a, even by a publisher and, and when it's going to be available for everybody. But kind of give me the the, the rundown here, Scott. I, I, it, I don't know where you want to start at. I mean, you've got <laughs> – I mean, we could start in the middle and still feel like we're at the beginning of everything for you. Yeah. We can have fun with this conversation. I'll either I mean, you'll either love me or never want to talk to me again after the podcast is over. So you know, depends well, on. I love, listen. you know, I I want to talk about your childhood for he, for just a heartbeat here. Yeah, I I only child, single parent home. Dad did a one year clip in jail. Mm-hmm. I watched addiction. You know, when, when some people say, "Oh, I'm sad," I'm like, "Let me introduce you to my mother, who was clinic legitimately." clinically depressed yeah, those yeah. things and i know what that did for me but can you kind of give me a little background when you say you had a you know what your childhood was can you kind of give us what that foundation was and how that hardened you at that point yes um well i was adopted first of all so uh i was adopted by i'm an i'm biracial so my biological mother is white my biological father was black i never met them uh, never met my biological father, uh, father recent, well, not recently, maybe 20 years ago, met my biological mother. Um, and, uh, within the past three years, I met my biological siblings, which was a, was an absolutely life event. One of the best things that has ever happened, brought some, brought major completeness to me, but, uh, growing up, it was, it was challenging because there was such a dichotomy there. Um, and one, in, in one instance, we were seen as literally the perfect family. My family were, my mom and dad were both very good looking people. My father was very established, made good money. Um, you know, we, as an African-American family, we moved to a quote unquote all white neighborhood uh, that had only four black families in it. And my father was highly respected. So on the outside, it looked very, very, we looked very successful. We had very nice vehicle, very nice car, very nice. Um, the yard was always beautiful. We won yard of the month a lot, that kind of stuff. But the inside uh, is, was like ruinous bones. And I mean, what I mean by that is that it's from, I get that from the Bible, that it's, um, it was uh, the, the motto of our house was no one needs to know what goes on in here. 
And the reason for that is because it was so incredibly dysfunctional. Uh, my father, uh, rest his soul, was a, this is tough to say, but I struggled to even know at this point if he was a good person. He was a, he was a responsible person, but he made some decisions that were very uh, ethically and morally devoid uh, with his, with the way he treated my mother. And then my mother in return, or as a result, I should say, got very, uh, uh, began to use alcohol excessively. And I believe to deal with his, his uh, outlandish and outrageous cheating and, and uh, abuse. And I was an only child. So when he left, I was the only target for her to kind of take out her frustrations. So you know, and again, I'm, I, I am no victim. Understand that I preach and teach not taking a victim stance. I'm just sharing with you what my circumstances were. So growing up, I'd learned to create or I did create rather a dual persona. You know, I, I was I was excessively everything. Like, for example, I was literally and I say this with humility, uh, probably the most, if not one of the most popular kids in high school. I got nominated for more class favorites than I could even be vote than I could ever than I could even be uh voted on. So I had to disqualify myself from two because you could only be nominated nominated from, from for four. So I had this extreme popularity. I was a really good athlete, all these things I was above and beyond. And then at home I was very isolated. I was very uh on the inside I was very I was very insecure, very self-conscious, very ashamed. And so that contrast, that conflict that I lived with and that I experienced growing up, it came to a head after after high school. You know, I was, you know, it's tough for a kid to literally live two lives. And I did not realize how what the, the impact that it was having on me until until I started. And in fact, I didn't realize it until after I went through a program in prison, which we can get to, that helped me to understand myself. But shortly after high school, you know, by living those two lives so, so brilliantly, I should say, I can say, or so, you know, um, skillfully is a better word, that even my closest of friends had no idea the challenges and the struggles and the difficulty that I was experiencing at home, you know. Um, but yeah, it, it caught up to me. And then I started acting out. I was started hanging out with, quote unquote, the wrong crowd, doing a lot of drugs. And I got I got in, I got, um, I became addicted and, and I started doing, you know, stealing cars and doing things to support that, that habit and found myself going in and out of jail. This is the late eighties, very, very early nineties, but I literally lived in jail for probably, um, you know, for most of the, well, in jail, most, uh, the last part of the eighties in prison, pretty much all of the nineties. Um, yeah, you I know were, we, we, talk, we covered a lot in that short period of time, but that's the shortened version. But I want to go back to something for a second. You, you, you said that, you know, you didn't make yourself a victim, but yet hearing the things that you're saying, you acted out as a, as kind of like, how do I get this, this energy that I don't know what to do with? You acted it out. I did. I, what I did is I don't believe in taking the victim stance. And okay, that's why so I say now, it? even then I wasn't a victim and I won't. Own so what's the victim. difference between, cause, cause we hear this all, all the time. Well, this person's playing the victim and you're, and we hear I'm, I'm not a victim or not taking the victim stance. What is the difference for you? That's a very good question, Sean. And my way of seeing the world, we have all been victimized. That's something we have no control over. None. But we do choose whether or not we want to be a victim, you know, and so that's the difference, in my opinion. Many matter of fact, all of us at one point in our lives or another have been victimized by us in some way, by some way. Yes. However, many people, unfortunately, choose to stay in that victim position. In fact, that vic in, in that victim stance, as opposed to taking ownership of their lives and deciding and choosing that I was victimized, but I am not a victim. And that's what I mean by that. Yes, I was victimized, and but by no means do I claim or own or, or a victim stance. Um, that's one thing, in my opinion, that holds folks back. And it held me back for years because I didn't always not take a victim stance. But once I learned to understand and, and accept that, you know, yeah, I was victimized. I got hurt. People did things to me that were unfair. 
But at the same time, I can make choices to move on and not as a and not be uh, not be held back by it, but you be propelled by it, if that makes sense. No, it makes a- absolute sense. And and what it sounds like to me, if I'm if I'm hearing you right, you you know, early on before you you realize, you probably may have said like, "Well, I'm doing these things because I did this because Absolutely. I'm acting this way because it was never, hey, I'm an asshole right now, and I could have chose to not do this, but but it's easy to to do it and then say I only did it because of you." not because I made a choice. Yeah, it's so difficult to put the light on yourself. You know, it's hard to look at yeah, you know, Nobody wants to see that. Yeah, you know, I, I said nobody wa- wants to see that. Like, I, no. I, yeah. I, I'm I, a firm believer. Look, I, I, I tell people this all the time. I stand in the mirror every day and look at my own self. And this is going to sound, may sound cornball, but I look in the mirror and I go, I tell myself I love myself 10 times. Man, that's beautiful. I love it. I love well, it. Bro, do you know how hard well, it is to love yourself? Who else is going to love you? You know? Do you know how hard it is to stare at yourself and do that and just no, go? Because I do it too. <laughs> do you do it? Okay. All right. So cool. So we're two, we're, we both can be jackasses with it. Like, hey, that, that, that's, and I have to like, I have to give myself finger guns. Right? <laughs> I have to give myself finger guns when I do it. Yeah, right? that's I like it. I like it. I give it back. I have to, but but so then, and I, you know, not not to pick at scabs, and I imagine most of this stuff is in your book, Absolution: The Dark Path to Light. Yes. A, a lot of this is in there, but what was what was it that put you on the long stretch to jail, to prison? Not just oh jail, prison. I talked about that- this. The book is an autobiography, and if you if you don't mind, I'd like to kind of tell you as before I answer that question how I, yeah, how I came about to me with, of me writing the book. I've had for years. I've had so many people. Man, you need to write a book. Oh my God, with what you've done and <laughs> you know, just your life is just crazy because I went from you know. Um, being adopted, very dysfunctional, abusive family, physically and emotionally, um, to uh, not understanding who I was, identity issues, prison, addiction, to finding a way to, and to homelessness, by the way, as recently as eight years ago, to oh, wow. becoming um, becoming uh, the CEO of one of the largest litigation firms in the country and being self-made. And yeah, no one gave me anything except advice. Um, so to answer your question, that's um, there's a part in that book that was kind of a pivotal moment in my life while I was in prison. I wrote about this in the book. You asked me what the what the um, what the long stretch, what the what the turning point. I think something along those lines. What? Yeah. So I mean, because I mean, you're you're lot. I mean, look, folks. If you know anybody who's ever done a real clip in jail, a real bid, I mean, you have one of two choices: either this is home forever. Or I'm never going back. hundred so percent. Well, and the I went. I was in and out of jail so much. And back in the '80s, everybody got slaps on the wrist. And no matter, you know, unless you really killed or did something really physically damaging or harmful to someone, most people got in and out, in and out. So it wasn't. It was a revolving door, and it wasn't very. Um, wasn't much of a ter- deterrent. You go in, you steal a few cars, you go in for a couple months, you you get your weight back, you eat good, you come out looking healthy and you do it again, you know? So it's kind of, you look kind of look forward to it, right? <laughs> so, but I did it so much that to answer your question, that third time a judge uh, insisted that I be classified as a habitual criminal. And they started the sentencing range when I was 23 years old, I'm 56 now. They started the sentencing got strange at 25 years. So I could get no less than 25 years. And, and I just couldn't accept signing a plea bargaining deal for that. So what happened was I went to court, went to trial knowing that I was going to get found guilty, but went anyway because I just couldn't bring myself to sign off for 25 years of my life. Right. Yeah. So, so I, long story short, I got convicted. And during the sentencing phase, which is the answer to your question, the sentencing phase, my attorney thought he had a brilliant idea on how to get the judge to show me leniency. He wanted to lean into my intelligence. I've always been, I say hu- with humility, above average intelligence, and I've always been a good communicator. And so during the sentencing phase, the, my, my attorney stood up to this judge who was probably in his 70s, an older white man. And that is relevant. And I say that that way because it's relevant to, and I'll explain why to why in a moment. And he said, judge, um, I don't think that Mr. Curley should have to spend so much time in prison because, you know, he's a young man. He, he made mistakes. 
and he's so smart. And as the United Negro College Fund says, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. This is what my ju- this is what my attorney said. Now the judge okay. turns around. The judge turns around and says, uh, "Counselor, I, I hear what you're saying. However, it also is a terrible thing to waste a mind." And man, when he said that, it literally gave me goosebumps again. The judge told my judge, my attorney, "It's also a terrible thing to waste a mind," and he turned that around so beautifully and brilliantly. Although I knew I was nailed and it was I was dead. You were that. screwed, but man, that that but, sounds. Good. But I was impressed at the same time, and I also felt a sense of compassion. So the judge said, "Mr. Curley, I'm going to sentence you to 35 years in prison." Now these days, that really means you're only going to do four or five years, but that's going to give you enough time to go down there and really think about your life and educate yourself and get your head on right. And so that when you can get out, when you get out, you can move forward and have the life that you deserve and never look back. Man, that's what the judge told me. I mean, I, that's a crying moment, man. And Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I'll tell you, when he said it, believe it or not, I felt him. I felt his compassion. And although I knew that it hurt so bad because I knew I was going for a long time. To me, 35 was 35. Right, right. I never, ever, ever ever felt, or uh, uh, how can I put this, from a stranger such compassion. He sentenced me with compassion, and I could tell that he really wanted me to get it. And I've never, ever, ever forgot that. And I went down there, and I really tried to do exactly what he said I should do. And that was one of the major turning points in my life. I, I, like, Scott, I, I can't even imagine it. And especially, so I'm a very, uh, I don't know if I'd say it, advocate but i'm very pro prison reform i've known a lot of people that have gone i have a close friend who did 16 Uh years for a crime he did not commit Uh and was acquitted for dna uh and there's no other way to say it but crooked cops put him behind bars well there they 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 wanted to convict somebody because it was a small town in new york and they Mm -hmm. needed to pin it on somebody right but Hearing, you know, because that's why and the reason I say that is hearing 35 today with the Biden crime laws, you'd have done 35 because you'd had a I would have done a lot more now. No question about it. No question. You have to do 80 because they they say you have to do 80 percent so that these states can get their federal funding. You have to do 80 percent of your sentence there. there, I don't know the, the specifics, but yes, I know that the laws are much more strict now. And had I been sentenced to that same number today as I was 20, 30 years ago, whenever that was in 1991, then I would have done. Yeah. We wouldn't be having this conversation. You'd we just would, be coming. Uh, exactly. You, yes. That's, that's an incredible. So, so you, you realize, Hey, I've got to make this, this turning point. How is it coming out? And this is something I, I've experienced through personal things in my life and people that I've known they come out with this attitude of I'm going to fix myself. I'm going to be better. Now things are going to be better. Now I know what I need to do, but society doesn't look at you that way. Society never takes that tag off of you society because too many people think that, well, I don't, Oh gosh, I'm not, I'm not getting that near that to the point. I recently had somebody tell me, yeah, I'm trying to get an apartment, but, they said they don't rent to felons. I'm like, you can't do that. That's discriminatory behavior. Yes. And, and But some people still, still have that mindset. Many, in in fact, unfortunately, Sean, many people do. So, so what was that like for you? Now we're talking, was that 96, 97 when you got, got out? 95. 95. So yes. you're getting out in 95. So we're, we're talking 26 years ago. Am I doing the math right? Or 27, 28, uh, 28, gosh, 28 years ago. What was it like when you, cause you're coming out and everybody's telling you, Hey, you did great. You're going to be better. Things are going to be better. And then you show up back on the other side. What was that like? Well, I'll tell you, ironically, it was, it, I never, because I never owned the title of inmate or convict. It was relatively easy for me because I was in it, but I wasn't of it. I never got a single tattoo when I was in prison I never joined any gangs. I kept to myself. I, I, I made it a, I made a conscious and deliberate effort to do better for myself. I went to college. I got a couple of degrees. Um, 
And so I, I knew that it would be tough. At the same time, I'm wired to not allow other people to tell me and to define me and tell me what I can and cannot do. Um, just because you, not meaning you, Sean, but just I'm because sure. society says I can't do something, that doesn't mean that I can't. That just means that I'm, it, may, it may be a it may try to make it a little bit more difficult, which is which segues into one of the things I talk to uh, inmates. And when I do my speaking engagements, I talk to folks about the difference between barriers and obstacles. An obstacle, I'm sorry, a barrier is something that you cannot get around. You can't get over it. You can't get through it. Being in prison is a barrier. Unless I unless I broke out illegally, there was no getting out of that. However, um, an obstacle is something is a challenge that if you think creatively and outside of the box and and and, 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 and if you're a bit ingenious, then you can find a way around, over or through uh, a, an obstacle. The problem are the the the, the, the um, yeah the, the problem that many people have and face is that they struggle with understanding the difference between the two. Many people see an obstacle and they define it or believe that it's a barrier. In life, there are so few barriers, but there are so many obstacles. But people often think just the opposite. There's so many barriers and so few obstacles, you know. I have nine felonies on, on my back. I spent, I did four stints in prison. I am not by society's uh, perspective supposed to be the CEO of a tax litigation firm no. Uh, member, uh, member of Forbes Council and, uh, and and being honored by Inc. Magazine. I'm not supposed to be that person, but I chose to live my life the way I wanted to live it. And I did not allow society to decide what I can and cannot do. So I say all that. I ramble a lot just to say that 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 there is always there's typically a way to find and reach your goal. You just have to stretch your way of thinking at times for anyone who is. Uh, has uh, certain challenges or even disabilities. How many, you know, there are folks who have physical disabilities who have climbed mountains. You know why? Because they found a way to do it. You know, so that is exactly why, although I have nine felonies and, I'm, and I've been turned down, I've lost hundreds of dollars on application fees because I couldn't get an apartment despite my uh, convictions being 20 years ago. That's happened. That's but, crazy. you know, so and at the same, here's a funny one. I own the type of company now that I couldn't even get a job in if I were to go work for it someone else. <laughs> you know, if I were to go try to apply at another litigation firm, they would turn me down because of my background. So what did I do? I just decided to start my own. Just just make your own. And look, folks, if if you're finding Scott right now or through me or me through Scott and you have questions about what he's got going on, please. Go ahead and type those questions in there. We see those comments live and we can ask Scott the questions right away. So please ask away. Um, brother, I, I'm just hearing everything. And, and I just think about so many people that if they were in your, your shoes, that things would be statistical. They would say, oh, well, I can't. I can't. I can't. Yeah. You and, have to be and, intentional. That's, the, that's so, what's so important because the fact is I do in my life and many people's lives, whether it be a... a a disability or if we're suffering from depression or if you've been to prison or, you know, we all have challenges that, that other people may not have to deal with. And, but the, what's most important is that we do not take a victim stance and we decide that, and we decide that because of our challenge, we just aren't able or worthy of having a good life. That's just not a healthy mindset. And I just absolutely refuse to accept that mindset for myself. Brother, I mean, it, it's impressive. So Thank with, you. with all, all these things that, that you're going on, and, and like you said, a lot of people told you, write a book, write a book, um, and, and do all this stuff. Um, what, what, like, oh, hold on a second. We're starting to get, get some things here. Man, I feel like I'm watching Tiki Barber speak. Twin, I think you look like Tiki Barber. That's I'm handsome. Great. I'm more handsome than Tiki. I'm, I'm going to go with that. Um, <laughs> he's Maybe more not. like Ron. Um, and, Aunt Rose says, how do you stay as not the victim ongoing? Because that's a great point. Like you, you said yeah. it, you had all these people that were, you know, like turning you down for jobs, putting yeah. in for stuff, you know, how do you keep out from being from that falling back into that victim's mindset? Well, there, that's, that's a wonderful question. Thank you, Rose. I appreciate that question. Cause I think it's one that needs to be asked and answered. Um, 
the easiest thing in the world is to take a victim stance and to blame everything else on someone else. The most difficult thing in the world at times for some, for many of us, myself included, is to look ourselves in the mirror and own our behaviors. And But the beauty in that is that once we look at ourselves and we accept I made a mistake and I look at myself in the mirror, I made a mistake, but I am not a mistake. So many people define themselves by their mistakes. And that's a huge problem. And that's one of the reasons why, why many people stay in the victim stance, because they define themselves as a mistake and mistakes don't go anywhere. Mistakes don't get to have good things or nice things or, or, or do wonderful things. Mistakes stay in bad places, you know, and so that is what happens. So many people, the what ha, what, in my opinion, the way to not do that is to not identify yourselves with yourself with a mistake. We all make mistakes, but none of us is a mistake. That's so that's, important. Dude, that's those are powerful words. Uh, and and Crystal over on Twitch wants to know: Was this your first business? It was the business you had now your first attempt at success. Like, was this the first business you ran? Let's first define the definition of success. You know, that's, I'm going to, I'm going to, it's a kind of a trick, trick answer. So thank you for the question. Uh, so my, my answer is going to be, no, it was not my first attempt at business. Uh, I've had some, uh, some moderate successes, but none like I have now. Um, but I want to back up and, and talk about the word success, because I think it's so important that we don't define success as being how much money we make or how much, how big our business is because that's not what defines success in my opinion. Success, in my opinion, is simply how many people you affect in a positive way. You know, if you can be dead broke, but if you are touching people in a positive way, then that, in my opinion, is what is make, what truly defines people's level of success. I, I would agree with that. That's that old saying of Im immortality is how long people remember your name for. Absolutely. For the good and bad. That's it. How, how, you're immortal. G Genghis Khan is still remembered. Absolutely. And, and, and no matter how you look at it, good, bad, or indifferent. Absolutely. Gandhi, Genghis Khan, Jesus, yeah. um, you know, Martin Luther King, you know, you can go on and on. Well, Jesus is a complete sidebar because I, there's a new movie coming out. Have you seen the new movie, Book of Clarence? No. Oh, that's, I had me dying laughing. Somebody figured out a way to take ancient Nazarene culture and turn it into almost a action flick. Oh my God. <laughs> I, you got to Like I watched the preview. I was like, it sounds so horrible that I want to look at oh, that. It's, it's like at one point in time, like they're like, turn over the Nazarene to us and I'll let you go and be wealthy. And the guy's like, Oh wow. I'm not wow. doing it. And they have like the music playing as everyone's throwing back their robes for their swords. I'm mm. like, we're doing this. We're yeah, doing really. This. Yeah. This is like, we have somehow figured out a way to finally put Jesus into a uh, action film. Wow. Yeah. It's, wow. it's hilarious. But so you're going through, you're, you're facing all the, these challenges as you're, you're first coming out. You're, you're not allowing them to define them. Was there anyone that you would give credit beyond yourself to say, Hey, this person handed, gave me a hand when everybody else said he doesn't deserve it. A few, a few. Um, when I got my first professional sales job, which was what uh, catapulted me and launched and started my journey to where I am today, uh, it was my first real job, I should say, out of prison. And of course, they had um, they had rules and policies that they would not allow ex felons to to um, to work for them, as many companies still do to this day. But the the man's name was Ron Rhodes. And I showed up at the interview early They and I was dressed nicely. And when they asked me about my, my if I had a criminal background, I, I, I looked them straight in the eye and told them, yes, I do. And I don't make any uh, excuses for my behavior. I did it. I own it. Everything that they claimed that I did feloniously is accurate. And was, I probably did more than they than they than they knew about at the same time. That's what I did then. This is where I am now. And if you give me a chance and you let me prove to you that, that I can that I can and will do this, I promise you I won't let you down. And he did. 
and uh, and that was the beginning of of my professional career. I started in sales, and in that position, in that company, I went from you know sales rep to the youngest uh, team lead, youngest sales manager in the company. I was only 28 years old, and it was a Fortune 500 company. And uh, so, and it, it also taught me, it showed me that it, it made me realize that I, I got a knack, I got a skill. I did not know, I, and and I'm so serious. I did not know. I knew I had the gift of gab. I knew that I could communicate effectively, but I didn't know how I could use that other than what I did in the criminal world. But I started making legitimate good money using my natural skill, which turned out to be sales skills. And uh, yeah, it was it was a wonderful thing. Sales is the greatest drug in the world that nobody wants to take. Man, I, I can't I, don't even get me started on that. <laughs> because bro. Yeah, I live and breathe it, actually. I love it. I love sales. Eric says, this is great to hear. I deal with this every day. And he does. So he, Eric is is a friend of mine. He's in staffing, but he deals with uh, entry-level positions, second mm -hmm. chance companies, and trying to show people that there are companies out there that will give you a second chance. So this kind of advice. And, and you know what, Eric? When, Can I when, speak to Eric uh, directly about, yeah, please, about that please. situation? Can, uh, can I direct a comment to Eric? Yeah. Yeah, please. So, Eric, I'm so glad that you chimed in because I will tell you from personal experience that someone who is coming out, who has been to prison, come out, we have an appreciation for things that most people take for granted. People will be in traffic complaining, bitching, and excuse, can I say that? I'm sorry. Yeah, you're good. About, about the fact that they're they're in traffic. Man, can I tell you, I love being in traffic. <laughs> you know, my worst day out here is still better than my best day in prison. You know, so so and I'll tell you that giving ex felons a chance, um, especially if they're nonviolent offenses, I, you're very likely to get someone who's just going to bend over backwards and bust their ass to, to prove to themselves and to you that they're worthy. And you're going to and I just encourage you to 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 look at those folks. They they, they can really be an asset. I had to give you some extra applause, brother. I had to give you some Thank extra you. applause. Thank you. And Crystal wants to know who's been your best supporter for you to become your best self. That's a great question. So who's had your back the most? This is a tough one. And um, <laughs> oh, I didn't have a lot of support uh, leading up to to where I am now. Now I have support now in my in my world where I'm at. But for any one of you guys who want to read the book Absolution: The Dark Path to Light. Um, I have a history of abandonment, you know, when people, when it gets tough, people just kind of bailing. So I, where I got my support from was through a program that is called IPTC. It stands for in, in prison therapeutic community. It was a program that was a very intense program that I had to go through before I was allowed to be released from prison. And it was a program that forced us to look at our behaviors and to deal with our behaviors and to understand why we act the way we act and why we behave the way we behave, which all is grounded in our emotions. Every single thing we do is based on how we feel. There's nothing that we do, nothing that any of us does that is not somewhere based on how we feel. There's nothing. So they taught us to manage our feelings better. So that is where I got my strength and education on how to manage my life better by understanding one of the things they taught us is do not make any decisions in a heated moment. None. Never make a decision. Most people get themselves in trouble either with family or with the law when they make decisions in a moment of passion. So that was very huge for me. And I know that doesn't quite answer her question. Well, maybe it does. I just didn't have a lot of support until recently when you know, I found my biological family and, you know, I went homeless. I was homeless eight years ago because I had very little. Yeah, I, I wanted to get, to get into that. And real quick, Eric says, you know, this is very refreshing. Uh, mm -hmm. He gives everyone a fair shot. And I know he does. Uh, companies, on the other hand, do not. But listening to you sell yourself is giving him some ideas to help incarcerated individuals moving forward. That's, that's awesome to hear, Eric. Yes. And look, folks, if, if you're looking to find out more about Scott, it's Scott. Allen with an E at the end of Allen, curly.com. His book, uh, it was on Amazon. It 
it got pulled for the right reason yeah. because now it's going to be another publisher has taken it. So would you say beginning of the year, it's going to be back well, it's, out? It should, it should be within 30 days. What happened and, and is that it got picked up by a major publisher. And so now it's going to be available in bookstores and online. At first it was just available awesome. online because I was self-published, but it did get picked up by a major publisher. So now it's being uh, published online and it'll be available in all brick and mortars. That's, and again, folks, that's absolution, the dark path to light. It's a great book, want, not to boast, but it's got a lot of funny stuff in there. And you know, it's, if it's you pretty, want somebody who's almost incapable of reading um, and has these smooth, silky sounds, if you want me to read your audio, let me know. I mean, it'll sound okay. Hey, hey you know, nobody will ever that. listen to that. <laughs> so let me tell you about what happened to me. Right? <laughs> well, I'll be there. But, but so, but moving forward here, so you know, you kind of had to through all this, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, but you said it a couple of times now, how do you go from, it sounds like in 95, you get out, you got your shit together. You got people on, on your side, you're moving in the right direction. And then all of a sudden here we are at, uh, eight years ago, you're homeless. Like, oh, well, what we're, what, I, what's, what we haven't discussed yet is that I was still dabbling in and out with drugs. So okay. that that was hugely uh, that was a huge uh, element or a uh, factor in why I was up and down, up and down, you know, and uh, it took it took decades for me to truly get a grasp on that. And I have still struggled with that, you know, as you know, recently, relatively recently. But with that and I want to encourage and one thing I am is very transparent. I am never going to pretend that I'm someone that I'm not, you know. I believe in owning my failures, but I also believe that we should own our successes. You know, and Absolutely. Muhammad Ali said it best. He said, all you have to do is get up one more time than you get knocked down. Just get up one more time than you get knocked down, you know? And so uh, the key is try not to get knocked down so many times, but, but yes, that was, that had a lot to do with it. I was, even though I was experiencing um, you know, moments of success as uh, when I was out of prison, I was still toying around and dabbling. I wasn't doing anything near like I did back in the 80s when I was just out of control. But still, it, I was holding myself back and not allowing myself to stay as focused as I could and should have been because I was still dabbling in and out, in and out. Drugs is always an interesting one, especially in today's society. Yeah. You know, I, I personally, I'm of the mindset, I believe in people think I'm maybe I'm crazy, but I believe in legalize everything and then take, there's an and, argument. Here's logic, and here's my logic. If you legalized everything, there's less people in prison. You spend that same exact money on rehab and treatment and, doing and you everything. put the cartels out of business. And, and, and right. They, they no longer have the power they have. And all of yeah. a sudden everybody's, you know, doing much better. And they're they're being treated for mental health for the reasons that they're probably doing this makes a whole lot more sense to me than people being incarcerated and locked away and and never getting the treatment. So I, I would not be sitting here and able to like I said, when I got out, I still made mistakes. I still struggled at times with with drugs. But I will say the treatment that I got, as I mentioned, the IPTC program that never left me. So even when I did. Uh, dabble or relapse uh, per se, I had the tools to pull myself out of it because of the treatment that I get that I was able to get when I was in prison. So to your point, I'm a living example of it working, you know? And, and I think the one thing you've said though, over and over is you've taken ownership of everything and yeah. we're, we're getting close to closing the bar. So, so I, I want to stay on these things. Cody yeah. says, uh, it's great. It's great when you can say, Hey, it's a great book knowing you put everything you could into sharing your story. See, that's why I'm not reading your, Thank your you, audio. Uh, Crazy Aunt Rose, who will be a guest here in a couple of weeks. I love that. She's self-published also. We're going to talk about her books. But, awesome. you know, moving into all this, the one thing that I've heard from you, Scott, and is you've taken ownership of everything. I've mm -hmm. never heard so far in this conversation, not once did I hear you say, I had all these jacked up things and it's their fault. Hey, <laughs> I took the program. And I said, well, let me run with this and see how I can get better in my program. Mm -hmm. uh, how much of those programs, though, do you see 
like, I, what's the right question? What made you, is it just the way you think you're wired that you were able to say, Hey, I'm going to take this program and I'm going to work with it. I don't know if you're doing AA or NA or anything like that, that kind of run with these programs, but what makes you feel like you were able to run with these programs where the average person, they can't, they, it's still somebody else's fault. I'm still angry at them. Because, well, with this program was all about t- helping us to understand ourselves. It really didn't have a lot to do with drugs, believe it or not. It was the type of program that we all could benefit from because we all struggle with managing our emotions and managing our feelings and how and managing how we should behave and react based on our feelings and emotions. That's what the program is about. It wasn't about teaching me about how to not get high or to drink. It was teaching me about it taught me how to deal with my emotions if effectively. And that is a, that's what it was. And the reason that it stuck so long is because it wasn't uh, grounded in uh, drug, uh, you know, usage and alcoholism. It wasn't if it had been that I probably would not have gotten as much out of it because I've never owned the title addict or alcoholic or anything. That, and I won't own that. You know, I won't. And and that's just my personal opinion. I'm not saying AA is wrong with their perspective. I am an addict. I'm an alcoholic. I'm just saying I'm not going to own that. I do own the fact that I used drugs and I used alcohol, but I'm not going to own the fact that I am that negative uh, negative that connotation. Negative I'm not going to I'm not going to put myself in that box or you know, that category. I love it. Now, I want to talk about a little bit more positive, because even though those things are and look, folks, we build our houses of our lives. This is this is where his foundation and his framework came. But now we get to hang the pretty things off of it and we get to paint the walls and we get to put the good blinds inside that house. That is our lives and, and keep up on it. What was it? So so now you you are the CEO of the largest tax litigation company. Is it Texas? One, US? Of, one of the largest, about the okay. fourth largest in the country, the fourth largest in the country. Roughly. And. You in a moment you can explain what tax litigation is. I'm assuming that's yeah. you know dealing with Uncle Sam and his criminal ass. He's the biggest criminal of all of them. Just <laughs> FYI, I don't give a shit. Um, I got a I got a letter the other day. Uh, yo, it's an extra thousand dollars. I'm like, for what? Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, we missed something. Well, that's not my fault. Oh, and here here's here's the uh, here's the fines associated with it. I'm like, how am I getting fines for something that I didn't even know was out there? You yeah. scumbags. You it's absolutely. tough. It's tough. I, I have I walk a line when I talk about it because yes. I, I understand your, you walk your line. Your I won't have to. Yeah. I'll kick the line all over. But um, <laughs> oh, they drive me absolutely bonkers. Uh, right. But how did we end up as? I mean, because that's huge to say. Hey, I'm a CEO of a tax litigation firm. I'm a public speaker. When did this thing just go? Because, like you said, eight years ago. We're living on the streets. Eight yeah, years later, awesome. we're we're on a different we're on a different trajectory. You know, yeah, where's the you, change? When I was homeless, my business partner, who is my partner to this day, his name's Brian Gordon. He was also in a very tough situation, and I'll give I'll make a long story uh, to one minute. Okay, um, that he he um, he knew that I had a, a history and and skills in this industry because I'd been in sales and I did well, and. Uh, so while I was homeless and he was going through a very tough situation also, we got together and just kind of were, you know, uh, supporting each other. And he said, man, I think I can come up with $2,000. You think you got one more in you? And I told him, I said, Brian, if it can be done, we can do it. So we started Finish Line Tax Solutions. If you want to Google finishlinetaxsolutions.com, that's our company. We have about 15,000 clients now. Um, we started that company with two thousand dollars and two and he and I, that was it. And um, and we turned that two thousand dollars to date into about 40 million dollars. And 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 the, and people ask all the time, well, how did you do it? And the answer, believe it or not, is is simple. I'm not saying the process was simple, but the answer is simple. The answer, we simply committed to our commitment. And what many people use the misuse the word commitment. You know, I commit to losing weight. I'm commit to this and that. Right, but the yeah. problem is that once once many of us hit a shortcoming or we eat, we overeat on a weekend, then we get disappointed and, and, and discouraged and we go back to our old behaviors. When you commit to your commitment, you accept the mistakes, but you view them as learning opportunities and you move forward. 
And that's what we did. And so we, when that first $2,000, we bought literally, I don't know if any of your listeners know what leads are, but we oh, have no leads are. Okay. So we had enough money to buy literally 10 leads. They cost 10, 10, uh, $200 a piece. So we bought 10 leads from a marketing company. I closed about five or six of them. And then we flipped that and made, made enough money to buy a few more the next week. And then we had a guy on the side that said, well, if you close some deals, then I'll do the work when I get off work, you know, to help you guys out. And it just snowballed from there. We finished, we took the first $2,000 after the first year we had about a minute, we did about a million dollars in revenue. We doubled in size uh, to the, to date. Now we've, we've generated about $40 million. And, and you were coming off the streets. Yeah, I was a liberal. I was still in the streets actually at that point. I was living, living in, a, in the streets. I was, well, I say I was in the streets. At that point, I was in a Super 8 hotel, which is kind of a, I don't want to knock Super 8, you know, but I it was, it was a tough spot. And there were roaches and all week that. Week. You, were, you were paying week to week. I was paying week, week to week, yes. And, and, uh, and, and the, the tricky part is I had people who, I told you I had abandonment issues. There were a lot of people who kind of abandoned me, but when they saw that I was, or heard that I was, got enough money, because what I did, I, I'll give you a 30 second story. I, I put a Facebook, I humbled myself and I was a humility, but I put a thing on Facebook and a GoFundMe. Can someone help me get out of the streets? And I was able to put together three or 400 bucks, which got me a little super eight room for a couple of weeks. And it's, and then I got a job offer to sell timeshares, but instead I chose to start a business with no, no money and nowhere to live. And then people got in my ear and like, take the job. Are you, are you insane to try to start a business when you're homeless? In my mind, it made perfect sense. To, it makes sense to, to me. And so that's why I followed my heart and gut. And so that was the beginning of finish line. Well, you know what? It makes perfect sense. You're already homeless. What are you going to do? What's the worst going to happen? Everything? What the fuck? Are you going to lose everything? Oh, my God. I lost everything. Oh, shit. <laughs> that was a great perspective. I've never thought about it like that. <laughs> Who gives a shit at that point? Brother, I'm loving everything about this. This is – I try to get people to understand stuff like this every day. And what you're talking about is I hate motivation. I hate it. Hate motivation. I, I I hate it when people are like, I'm motivated to lose weight. <laughs> I'm motivated to start my own, but no, you're not. Because if you're motivated, the shit will end next week. It's the first time you hit a bump in the road. If you're obsessed to do it, if you have an obsession for it, if you're obsessed with success, you're going to do it. Brother, you are obsessed. And I Thank love you. it. That is that is what makes it happen. Uh, Aunt Rose says, the ownership makes it easy to converse with you. Uh, Cody Thank says, you. I agree with that. I am statement is powerful and, and have to be careful how we use it. Mm -hmm. uh, I we agree with that. Mistakes, you know? But we are not a mistake. And, uh, and, and Eric is giving it a wow again, brother. I Thank mean, you, now you, you then get into public speaking. What was that like? And you've said it, you you've gone back into, into the prison system and you spoke with, with inmates in the past. I love what it. was it? What was it like? walking back in through the front door that gave me goosebumps um it was it was um surreal but i'll tell you the moment that i stepped in the auditorium and i connect and i engaged with the guys i have such a passion and love for these guys to this day because i know and other people may disagree they all made mistakes and i tell them sean i tell them that if you did what the what you got convicted of you're where you're supposed to be own that you, you that's you're here but this too shall pass and use this as an opportunity to build and grow and learn and prepare because you will get out one day and so how did it feel it felt surreal but i felt so much love and and i felt it back and they they made me stay for hours longer than i was supposed to they they literally did and i'll tell you one other thing before we have to close that i get so much uh, uh gratification from when I speak, I speak at uh, rotaries and other forums, and and oftentimes I'm in very amongst very conservative groups, and um, which is fine. I love conservative. I love liberals. I love people. You know. Um, so um, there was there have been a number of times where after the engagement, um, some folks from the audience would walk up to me and say, "Man, you know what? I you have made me rethink my position on on." Ex felons and people who have who have, who are in prison, and I appreciate you. I, there was one guy; he's in his seventies, and bless his heart, I, I get he gave me a hug, he, and he literally started crying because he said, 
I've been missing. I've been thinking about people who make mistakes wrong my whole life. And I want to thank you. And my God, I'll tell you, there's nothing that compares to the to the, to the happiness and the gratification that I got from helping him see that we make mistakes, but we're not a mistake, man. You know, we've all That's made right. mistakes. It, it's so hard for people to 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 allow people to make mistakes, yeah. to give them a chance to make mistakes. I think that, you know, as a parent, I don't know if you have any kids yet or not, but as a parent, I think that's the the one thing that so many of us don't allow our kids to do is make mistakes. Yeah, you know? um, it, we're not defined by our mistakes. We're defined by how we deal with our mistakes. There we go. It's how did you get back up? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and Rose, what did you learn from it? Yeah. Aunt Rose says that's that's beautiful, brother. Thank any you, Rose. Any, Rose. any any upcoming speaking engagements in Texas or around the country? Well, where somebody are, can find you. Well, they're relaunching. Um, I've kind of taken a break from it uh, during the holidays and and um, I've started another business. Uh, you know, I'm always I'm the I'm the serial entrepreneur. And I so I'm it. focusing What's on that. What's um, the new one? I have I have some vacation properties. I mean, I'm sorry, properties that were that we're um, now uh, making turning into vacation rentals. And it's actually been doing pretty good. Totally different from you know, doing a tax resolution. And plus, believe it or not, I've always been a city guy. Well, I grew up in the country, but but now I'm back. I have 23 acres out here. And so I spend a lot of time out in the on my land, just just uh, connecting with with nature. And it's it's done wonders for me. So but yeah, that's how I spend a lot of my time. So so no upcoming speaking engagements, but they can find anything they want to know about you on Scott, Scott Allen Curly dot com. That's uh, close. Uh, and Eric say, and if anyone needs any tax help, go to finishlinetaxsolutions.com. dot com. Say this, so yeah. and, and Eric saved us because Nate's not here. <laughs> That's a Nate's great time. question. What What has been your favorite meal since getting out of prison? Uh, well, well, Eric, mind you, I got out twenty eight years ago, so um, I will tell you they did. They had um, prison does not have red beans and rice and Cajun food. And that is my abs. That was my absolute favorite meal when I got out. I went. I went to a, uh, a restaurant down in Houston called Papados, which is uh, Papados. Okay, yeah. And I went to, and I and I went and got a Cajun seafood platter, and and yeah, it was to die for. All uh, right, you know, look, look, folks. A- as we say every week, and we we talk about this. If you're finding uh, us through Scott or Scott through through us, take a moment, give a like, give a share. Uh, man, we, yeah, you don't have, we don't have good Cajun food. Uh, <laughs> give a like, give a share, Come going, to on, going on to, to Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, going into Apple, Spotify, any of those spots and hitting that, that like, and leaving a comment, it might sound trivial to you. It might sound like nothing to you, but that two minutes that it takes you to do that is how Scott's message grows. That's how this show grows. That's how more people know what we're doing, what we're involved in, who's out there. That's that's my my journey. That's Scott's journey. You're part of that journey with us. So yeah. being able to put your that's name good. on there, that, that's how you're able to say, I knew when. Also, folks, make, make sure you're checking out for when Absolution, the dark path, the light comes out. Looking for, uh, oh God. Uh, yes, Cody, we'll talk about that real quick. And and going <laughs> on to scottallencurley.com. Scott, do you like elephants? I love elephants. I completely forgot about this. So Cody's got this thing where um, some elephant, and she'll explain it better than I will, uh, called We Joy, I think is what it's called, where like an elephant was celibate for like the last eight years because he got yoked away from his crew. And mm. now he now he's like back. They're trying to get him back with the lady elephants. <laughs> and I learned from, from Aunt Rose that elephants eat for 16 hours a day and oh, poop wow. every three minutes. I learned that from her earlier. So... Uh, I have to tell you, <laughs> there's a lot of information uh, going on here. Aunt Rose says, remember, like she always remembers, that's the end of the show, Aunt Rose. And <laughs> and Cody says, we, oh, here we go. R- Rummy says, uh, what is your favorite animal? Do you have a favorite Gorillas. animal? Gorillas. We'll end it with that. Gorilla. Oh, look, I, look at that. Isn't that cool? That is, yeah. That's a pretty nice piece you got yeah. there, brother. Yeah, that's that's my favorite. And I, I got that out of prison a, a couple years ago. So, yeah, so, I love gorillas. Gorillas are, are pretty, and they're and Scott's in Scott. Where are you in Texas? I got to get ready to end this show here in a moment. Um, my buddy Scott, my, my not, no, not you, Scott, Scott. 
this Scott right here that just just said yes, he's in Texas also. Hey Scott, he and he's a professional. Yeah. Uh, he's a he's a professional beard competitor. Oh, so wow. he wins like beard. He wins a uh, beard growing contest and stuff okay. like that. We all and, have our uh, talents. He he he's in Boot Buddha, Texas, outside of Austin, Buddha. Okay, Buddha. I've heard of it. I've heard of. It. I want to go to Austin only because I. I really love music and I hear all the good stuff about Austin yeah. and music, but don't log off on me, Scott. We got to talk for a moment afterwards mm -hmm. and not okay. you, Scott, Scott, this Scott, not you, Scott, this Scott, the, you, me. Scott. you, Scott. Okay. Not that. You, Scott. Okay. <laughs> I, I just wanted to make that all very confusing. And look, yeah. here's Cody. All oh, the beard episode was my favorite above the bar. Listen, we, we, we spent four hours on, on an episode. We just, Oh we my just goodness. Went. Scott right. and I just went. It was it was a whole nother thing. Yeah, Scott the Sakura is making it confusing. But as we said before, I know you've listened to all 210 or 211 episodes, whatever this is. And we end every episode with the exact same thing, the exact same uh conversation. So the most important thing, you probably know what's already coming here, but I'll ask it anyway. The guest always gets the final word, Scott Allen. So what's the final word? The final word I would say is, is just get up one more time than you get knocked down. You know, that's, that's the main thing, no matter how trivial it may seem, do not take a victim stance in anything. We be a, don't be a, don't be a volunteer to be a victim, be a victor. Alrighty folks, be sure to push your stool in. This has been a Second Front Podcast presentation found on Apple, Spotify, and wherever podcasts can be found.